like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Hello and uh, welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar Series. Uh, it's going to be an interesting talk today. We have Morten Scheibe Knudsen, uh, whose name I can never say right, so don't laugh at me, Morten. Uh, but before that, I want to remind you to use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions, and we will try to get to as many as possible. We have Max back to collate questions today, so that should be good. And I want to start the show by uh, giving you a little update on some recent research that came out by Jovan Lee uh, in my lab. And, and they'll be talking about the, the benefits of walnuts. Uh, uh, Jovan? Thank you, Prof. Ryan. As Ryan has introduced me, I am Jovan from the Center of Longevity at US. And in this study, I'll be introducing the walnut and healthy aging. This content will be broken down into introduction study design, and implication. So this study is of significance and interest because aging is often paired with cognitive decline. With increasing longevity, we see an increased risk for dementia. For instance, Singapore had one of the worst life, highest life expectancy in 2018, and with comparably high rates of dementia of every one in 10 elderly. This age-related cognitive decline is due to oxidative stress and therefore, research suggests that an antioxidant-rich diet can decrease this risk for cognitive impairment. While studies have found some conflicting results of mild effects on the, these diets on connection, they were generally supportive of a Mediterranean diet and a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids to preserve cognitive health. Walnuts, too, have been said to be a brain food due to its rich alpha linolenic acid which is a plant-based omega-3 fatty acids, and also its rich polyphenol content. Research has found association between walnut and cognition. However, these clinical trials are short. Therefore, this study, study undertook a two-year study intervention, which is said to be a minimum period for appreciable changes in the cognitive function. This is a randomized control trial and is observer-blinded to reduce bias. So over 700 participants who were cognitively healthy and aged over 63 were recruited from two sites, the Loma Linda University and Hospital Clinic, Barcelona. The control group were asked to abstain from walnuts and the treatment group were supplemented with walnuts at 15% of one's daily energy requirement. This is said to be cardioproductive and hence could benefit the brain. Moving on, so for this two years period, dietitians visited the participants every two months and food consumption was monitored. Blood samples were also taken at the start and end of the study for nutrient intake profiling and APOE genotyping. APOE is a gene associated to Alzheimer's and carrying the E4 allele itself is a risk factor. On connection, this is measured based on the global cognitive composite score with domains of memory, language, perception, and frontal function. The brain imaging by MRI and fMRI were also performed. So let's move on to the findings. First, on nutrients intake, for the walnut group, there is a significant increase in walnut, fiber, and alpha linolenic acid, or ALA for short, intake from, base, intake from baseline compared to control, and this is significant. 
in connection. However, we show that the one group has a slower decline in the global composite score and across its respective domains. However, this is not significant from control. But if we were to look within the Barcelona cohort itself, there is a significant change in the global connection compared to control of a difference of negative 0.6. This means that the Barcelona walnut group cohort has a slower decline in connection. And this translates to a 1.24 years of cognitive aging. For neural imaging, MRI detects structural differences in the brain and study found no group differences regardless of the APOE we stated. For fMRI, this is an imaging that detects the functional differences in the brain, where for the Barcelona cohort itself in the control group, there's a significant increase in the brain activity outside of this task-associated region. So if we were to look at the figure below, there is the blue regions. These are the regions of activation that is task-associated. But following the control group at follow-up, there is these red regions, which are the activation outside of the task-associated region. This reflects an age-related cerebral damage and reduced brain efficiency. So then what implications does this study bring? First, taking these walnuts at 15% of one daily energy requirement did not delay cognitive decline. However, Barcelona cohort showed promising results of improved global connection of about 1.3 years differences in cognitive aging compared to control. fMRI evidence also suggested that this consumption of walnuts attenuated the age-related decline in working memory efficiency. This is in line with the Alzheimer's research on intervention where following interventions, while the brain structures remain relatively intact and, and unchanged, the, well, the pattern of activation remains relatively stable. However, while these are encouraging results, evidence are still inconclusive about the walnut's effect on brain health, and that this two-year study period may be insufficient to detect significant cognitive changes. Therefore, potential considerations could be a longer study duration or the use of one aspects that will provide a more concentrated source of alpha linolenic acids and the polyphenols. With that, thank you for your kind attention. I hope you have enjoyed, and I'll hand on the time over to Prof. Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Jovan. Um, so it's great. We have uh, Morton on tonight. He's Associate Professor at the University of Copenhagen. His work focuses on the basic blocks of life, DNA, uh, and how damaged DNA may contribute to pathologies and aging. He's kind of a jack of all trades. He does in silico stuff, he does in vitro stuff, in vivo stuff. Um, and he, the approach is really to try to help people live longer, healthier lives. Uh, Mar Martin, the title of your talk is Interventions in Premature Aging. But I think the more important question now is what's your walnut consumption like? Um, I actually moved uh, two years ago from a house where there was a walnut tree, so it's declined drastically, <laughs> that unfortunately. <idea. laughs> That's terrible. Uh, so, but I, I definitely have to increase it. <laughs> it's very good. Thank you very much. Shall I share my screen? Yes. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really uh, excited to be here, and it's a great pleasure to be able to give this talk. Uh, and so my lab uh, focuses on on aging and uh, sort of the phenotypes that are associated with aging and understanding the molecular basis of these uh, phenotypes and so one of the phenotypes is of course that you as you get older begin to develop graying of hair you get uh, facial wrinkles you get a redistribution of uh, subcutaneous fat pigmentation changes in your skin um, and then you are sort of done. So that's a bit depressing. Um, but of course, there are many phenotypes associated with aging. So here, we basically downloaded PubMed and looked at uh, features that are associated with normal aging and the prevalence of those features in an elderly population. And so the most prevalent feature is uh, graying of hair, which accounts for, which about 99% of everybody will develop. And the 1% that does not develop it are the ones that are completely bald. And I apologize for the people that have heard that joke before because I, I say it often. Um, but there are other features, of course, that are much more um, uh, serious. So, for example, cancer, about 40% of everybody will develop some type of cancer. 
and dementia between 10 and 20 percent of the population will develop some you know, sort of dementia and so all of these are of course age associated and understanding the molecular reason driving these phenotypes is is therefore extremely important and so i'm starting very basic we can define aging as a time dependent increase in risk of death um and this looks something like this. This is data from the Social Security Administration in the US, where you can see your risk of dying the next year as a function of your age. And this uh, increases exponentially a little bit faster for men than women. And as you hit 121 years, your risk of dying the next year is close to one because that's the world record of aging. Um, if you translate this into a survival curve, this is the survival curve of the Danish population. Um, as you get older, people will die off and you have a mean age in Denmark of about eight years. Um, and this curve is maybe not that interesting, but what's more interesting is that we have uh, begun investigating registry data in Denmark where we have really uh, quite amazing registries. So each line here is a cohort of individuals that have been giving a uh, prescription drug going back the last 40 years. And then we have uh, various registry data and these people, for example, also the, the, the time of death. And so we can uh, look for drugs that uh, potentially extend lifespan. And this came really out of this association of uh, metformin, um, uh, this observation that if you give metformin to 70 year old people then you it appears that you are um reducing the mortality rate in that population compared to even healthy 70 year olds and so we look for example for metformin in the data set and if you look overall at metformin is associated with a shortened lifespan if you look at only 70 years old where metformin is initiated you can see that the metformin group in blue here actually do have a survival benefit the first 10, 15 years, but then this line crosses with the general population. So this could, of course, be because there's an underlying diabetes that, that could then come into effect here. Uh, I think what's maybe also interesting is even in the young individuals, there is actually a slight survival benefit here in, in the beginning. So this, I think, is actually quite encouraging. Uh, so we looked, of course, for compounds. And this is a work that's very much starting up now, so it's, but I think it's quite exciting. So um, we have uh, identified a number of compounds that we're then uh, looking into uh, if they can do something about a lifespan in, in various model organisms. And this work, we are hoping to get funded through uh, a new initiative, which is called VitaDAO, which is a... Um, sort of a blockchain technology where individuals can invest into uh, drug development at the very basic level and actually gain ownership of that IP that's been generated. So the, the hope I think is uh, sort of in the long term, the idea is that for example, if you're diabetic, you get a co-ownership of the compound that you're treating yourself with. So it's sort of a decentralized way to do drug development, which I think is really exciting. So uh, one take home message is that aging is not magic. It can be influenced by drugs. But of course, uh, aging occurs also in very many different organisms, despite us having the same fault based pairs in our genomes. And we live vastly different lives, right? So there are in, in the lab, for example, we use fruit flies that live that have a maximum lifespan of 80 days. We also look at mice and uh, humans to some extent. And there are more extreme uh, organisms. There's this hydra, for example, that really does not show an increase in risk of death over time. So in a sense, if we go consider our definition of aging as an increased risk of death over time, then this organism actually doesn't really age. So aging is not magic. It's also influenced by our genes. And one example of this, which is something that I've been studying quite a lot, is uh, diseases of premature aging, where we uh, 
know that there's an inherited defect that you get from your parents. And unfortunately, that leads to a faster rate of uh, aging. And interestingly, many of these and diseases are associated with mutations and genes that are involved in repairing DNA, suggesting that DNA repair is not important in aging and, and DNA damage is important in aging. And so some of my old work sort of uh, highlighted uh, sort of the interconnectivity of aging as I know Brian is also a big uh, proponent of that, that the various um, phenomena we see with aging are very interconnected. So for example, we, um, we know that DNA damage can lead to changes in the metabolism and mitochondrial function in a premature aging. We have some evidence suggesting that this occurs through activation of an enzyme called PARP1. But DNA damage drives hyperactivation of this enzyme, leading to loss of metabolites, NAD and acetyl-CoA, and then neurogeneration. And so we can actually intervene um, and inhibit part one, and then that rescues uh, lifespan changes in premature aging, and uh, this is in worms. We can use an NAD precursor, and then that rescues uh, the uh, transcriptome and the cerebellum of these, um, of mice, actually. Uh, we can also go in and increase the CO a through ketones, uh, rescuing some features of aging. So this was in, in a pre, in, some of the published premature aging diseases. So one question is, is that are there other accelerated aging diseases that we are not aware of? And so to answer this question, we looked at a database called the Online Mendelian Inheritance and Man database, which is a, um, a large database of genetic diseases where there is a phenotypical description associated with that disease. And so we can then use our um, curated features of aging that we extracted from PubMed and then look for overlaps with the diseases in this database. And doing that, we can see that there's actually a large amount of diseases that show overlap with normal aging, including DNA repair disorders, uh, but also other diseases, um, the inborn errors of metabolism or mitochondrial diseases. Um, but we identified one disease, which was quite interesting, which was called Woodhouse Saccade syndrome, which is a disease where there's not really anything known about this disease. So it's a very rare autosomal recessive disorder. There's about 80 patients that have been reported worldwide. Um, the patients develop alopecia, hypogonadism, et cetera. And it's caused by mutations in the DCAF17 gene. And there's no good correlation with um, where the mutation is and the phenotypical outcome of the patient. So just to sort of uh, highlight, um, so this individual here is actually 17 years old and obviously she looks much older. So we thought this could be a premature aging disease. So we did our uh, clustering analysis to find um, associations between the different diseases based on phenotypes. And we can see that what Asakata syndrome associates strongly with normal aging, with well-known premature aging diseases such as Werner syndrome, Hodgkin's Hodgkin's So this sort of supports that it could be a premature aging disease. Historically, the way you've been diagnosed with premature aging is that you have gone to your doctor, and then the doctor looks at you and says, uh, you look kind of old. And then he writes a, a case report and submits it to a journal. And then eventually it gets accepted by the field that it's a premature aging disease. So it's quite biased based on, of course, the doctor that looks at the individual. So we thought we could do it more unbiased. And we trained a deep neural network to be able to recognize the age of an individual based on the, the facial photograph. And then we... Um, so this is the predicted age and the real age. And so all the blue ones are Hodgkin's criteria patients. And you can see that they are predicted to be in general older than the real age. In general, this, they're predicted to be 60% older. So that they have an age acceleration of about 60%. Werner syndrome, as shown here in yellow, um, 
it's a more slowly progressing disease than Hertz-Gilbert's progeria. Um, and uh, they have an age acceleration of about 20%. And so what does a kind of syndrome actually lies in between? So it suggests that it's a, could be a premature aging disease. So we were very fortunate uh, to actually be able to identify the first two patients with this disease in Northern Europe. And we were able to get uh, blood samples from the patients. And we ran this through an algorithm that can predict the age of the uh, of an individual based on around 30 different uh, blood sample values. This is um, the work spearheaded by Alex Aronkov. Um, and we can see that they're pretty good to be much older. Looking a little bit at untitled pyramids in the blood from the patients, we can see that there is an enrichment of proteins involved in DNA damage, cell response to stress, uh, which is, I guess, um, consistent with the idea of DNA being important in, in, in preserving uh, youth. We looked a little bit into the molecular basis um, and um, looked at the interacting partners of PCAS 17. We did a pull down a couple of the mass spec, identifying DD1 uh, uh, and DDA1 as strong interacting partners. And in fact, this interaction seemed to be driven by a single arginine at position 354 in DCAF-17. This is highly conserved across all animals. Um, and um, we further investigated uh, how DCAF-17 might be involved in um, DNA repair and uh, found that DKF-17 is recruited to laser-induced DNA damage. So you shoot cells with a, with a laser to induce strand breaks, and then you can see that DKF-17 is recruited, recruited to these strand breaks, suggesting that it's involved in DNA repair. And so this is a sort of very broad overview. Uh, we think that DKF-17 is probably involved in replication-dependent repair. Um, uh, and this uh, story has been spearheaded by Daniela Bakula and um, will hopefully very soon be submitted. Um, so this is the idea where a psychiatrist is another premature disease and it's actually caused by defective DNA. So DNA repair is important in aging. This is uh, the number one take home message for this uh, talk. So what if we could stimulate DNA repair so how could we do this? So one idea is that uh, we turn to Nietzsche, as you so often do. Um, he said, what does not kill me makes me stronger. And this is actually also the case for cells. So if you stress cells and you don't kill the cells, then they adapt to the stress and become stronger. Uh, and this is uh, often called the hormetic response. And we thought about maybe we could exploit this hormetic response to be able to find drugs that, uh, that could stimulate DNA repair. So the way we did that uh, was in collaboration with a company called Encilical Medicine. We trained a deep neural network to uh, be able to recognize the transcriptional signature of various DNA damaging uh, insults. And then we look for that pattern in, in, in large databases of, of compounds uh, where there's a connected transcriptional signature. And so we screen about 15,000 compounds in silico uh, and uh, found a number of interesting bits. Uh, but of course, we wanted compounds that elicited the hormetic response but without actually causing DNA damage. And so to do this, we, um, we used a technology called the common chip assay. This was done in collaboration with Amula Technologies and, and Peter Sikora at Amula Technologies, where we um, can embed uh, cells into micro wells in, in 96 well plates. I think they are even now doing it at 384 well plates. 
So you embed the cell in the plate and then you run an electrophoretic field across uh, the plate. And if there are breaks in the DNA, then the DNA will be drawn out. So to illustrate, so here you have the nuclei of the cells. If, if the drug induces damage, you get DNA being pulled out of the nucleus, forming a comet. And this is why we call it the comet assay. So we can see that some of our compounds do induce uh, DNA damage, but a number of them actually do not induce DNA damage. So as a functional outcome, we also wanted to see if the drugs could induce this hormetic response, this protection against uh, subsequent DNA damage. And uh, to do this, we, um, we exposed cells to a very high concentration of, or a very high dose of ionizing radiation and looked for survival over time. And in general, about 80% of cells die, but there's actually some cells treated with certain compounds that become completely resistant to this ionizing radiation. Um, so what is the effect of this on, on uh, sort of outcomes of associated with aging? So uh, I'm just gonna diverge for a few minutes on a, on a different track. Uh, so one way we wanna measure senescence is through um, image-based analyses. So Indra Heckenbach has a development algorithm where based on the nucleus shape, you can predict whether or not a cell is senescent. And it's actually extremely accurate. Um, and since it's uh, using nucleus shape for this analysis, you can actually use it in many different types of dyes and in different tissues and even in different species. And so here I'm showing uh, data from uh, using the actually in vitro trained predictor on h and &E stained tissues from the skin of, of uh, individuals, of people, um, where you can extract the nuclei using a deep neural network. And then the deep neural network can predict whether or not a cell is senescent or not. And so with age, you, you get an increase, particular in repetitive associated senescence. And what's very interesting is that if you have, um, few senescent cells in your dermal uh, layers, then you have an increased risk of developing neoplasms over time. So this kind of confirms the idea that senescence is, is actually a, a um, strong barrier to cancer development. So this is currently a bioarchive that has been submitted somewhere. Um, so we used uh, the predictor to look for senescence in um, in, in the cells treated with this compound F and found that it decreases senescence. Um, we also looked at um, DNA damage. So we used the Campisi method to induce senescence where you treat cells with ionizing radiation, then you wait for a week where the cells are not growing. Uh, and then you see that there's an increased number of DNA damage foci. Um, even in, in, so this is actually vehicle treated, uh, so after nine days. But if you treat with this drug F, you actually reduce the amount of these persistent or often referred to as irreparable DNA damage flows on. So this is quite a, kind of interesting. Um, so we also wanted to investigate how this could work in, in, um, in animals, and one thing we're doing in the lab is to use computational methods to track and uh, analyze animal behavior and lifespan. This is spearheaded by Michael Peter, uh, and we have a spin-out called Track Bio that you can try to visit. And so this is basically how it works. Um, you can see that the AI is able to recognize the flies and then follow it over time. And it's actually, I think, which is interesting, able to predict the age of the flies just with some accuracy based on this sort of grainy image, which I think is really quite um, impressive. Uh, so anyway, so you get these movement tracks uh, from the flies. This is a young fly through the vehicle. It moves like this. When you give a drug F, it moves like this. 
when you become an old fly, you move less. Unless you're on drug F, then you still move a lot. And um, this is then quantified here. This is basically one uh, time point here in this in these plots. Uh, so it sort of preserves the motor function. And it also extends the lifespan of flies with, I think, 10 or 20%. So we've created a number of analogs. This is coming out a little bit bad. This is compound F and this is some of the analogs. And they're able to uh, also reduce DNA damage. Uh, I'm not showing that here, but they actually facilitate the cells re-entry into a cell cycle and expression of PCNA, which is a marker of replica replicating cells. Uh, so you get PCNA expression um, and an increase in cell number. So this is something that we're looking uh, into more, particularly in target identification. But considering the technology, this data was trained on ionizing radiation, but we, we have the same uh, way of um, finding drugs. You're looking for thermal UV radiation oxidative stress. So I think this is quite exciting. So in the final uh, few, uh, final minute here, I'm just going to highlight a, um, a meeting that we're having, the Aging Research and Drug Discovery meeting that will be in Copenhagen this year in August. And I highly, uh, last year we had more than 2,000 delegates. Uh, Brian Kennedy joined and he's joining again uh, this year. Um, I hope we have a confirmation, I think, at least. Uh, and so um, I really encourage all of you to join this meeting and this is there will be more speakers announced also as we go forward uh, and and this is spearheaded by myself and uh, alex as your uncle and daniela bakula and with that i will uh stop here i think and uh, this this is my research group these are our collaborators uh, and this is uh, some of our funding here and uh, I appreciate you listening in and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Martin. Now, that's really interesting. There are a lot of topics to cover there uh, and a lot of interesting data. So that maybe I can go through some of it. And uh, I wanted to start off a little bit on non-science. You know, you first of all, uh, one of the things we want to do is sort of uh, tell people some of the research going on around the world. And I know you're with the uh, Center for Healthy Aging at University of Copenhagen. Maybe you can just spend like 30 seconds or a minute telling us about what that center and what it does. Yeah, definitely. So this is a center that has been in existence for, I think, uh, 12 years. Um, and uh, it was really started with the idea of having a very broad approach to aging. So there is it's reasonably large and, and cross faculty. So we have you know, humanities, we have uh, social science, um, we have uh, you know, epidemiologists involved and uh, molecular biologists and physicians. So we're sort of covering a very, very broad range of interest in aging. And the idea is of course to to try to understand aging, but also to develop interventions that are actually applicable into society. So this is, uh, I think, a major focus. It's been funded by the Nokia Foundation. Uh, and, uh, I think an interesting approach. Yeah, I've been there a couple of times, and I'm impressed with the diversity of research that's going on there. It's really kind of covers the whole, uh, a wide range of what aging is. Mm -hmm. so that's quite exciting. Uh, you mentioned a uh, cryptocurrency strategy and uh, um, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about that. So, I mean, uh, I, we haven't really discussed cryptocurrency on, on the show before, so maybe you could just like summarize again what you're doing there and how it relates to the university. So. I mean, for sure. So this is, um, you know, I, I'm not a cryptocurrency expert, but I'm, um, very always, of course, interested in looking for funding and ways to fund science. I think all of our us researchers are constantly uh, looking at ways of how we can um, um, maintain or increase our uh, scientific output. And this, of course, costs a lot of money. 
And um, one way that uh, I thought about for a long time about you know, funding science is through crowdfunding. And then a couple of years ago, and crowdfunding traditionally is that you know someone donates money or a group of people donates money and then a project gets launched. So the people that donate money don't really get anything out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, I got in touch with uh, Tyler Colato, who's the um, CSO of, of, a, of a company called Molecule, which uh, has this uh, idea of democratizing drug development. So allowing everybody to get a piece of the IP um, that's being developed through donating money. And one way, one major issue, of course, with IP is to be able to maintain who actually owns it. And this is historically done by patenting, of course. Uh, but but the, the, um, the good thing about blockchain is that here you have a continuous record of who actually owns what and when, uh, so that you can actually maintain IP, completely know where does it start and where, who now owns it and, and so forth, right? So, so in a way, I don't think we will not be able to avoid patenting because uh, this is um, this will not be possible considering how important that is in society. But but it's a way to actually allow people to prove that they own part of this IP. So it will be through these non fungible to- tokens, which are sort of a proof that this is your piece of the piece of the pie, right? And um, so I, I'm really excited about that because it really allows everybody with any interest to um, put in money into this project and potentially, of course, in the cryptocurrency space, a lot of this is, is about making money, right? And so it's just, for people, it's often a short-term investment. They invest basically just to try to get... Uh, a, um, some sort of money out in the other end, but here there's actually a product. So you invest something that actually may be developed into something that is useful for society, useful for, for everybody, and could potentially even make you some money because the, the IP can become more valuable. And uh, so that's one thing. The other thing which I think is exciting about this is that it, it, um, it would be a very open, we're aiming this to be a very open source type of project. So we will every week, and we already post our first videos, but we, every week we'll post how is the research ongoing, what are the results from the last week, and, and so forth. So everybody will get a, a glimpse of the scientific pro- progress. So I think I'm really excited about this, and I think it's... Can people engage already, or is it still in, in preparation? People can engage. There is a, a Discord uh, channel. So if you go to vidadao.io, I think, uh, then you can you can look at how to get engaged with this, mm. um, and the investment is not open yet. But uh, I think um, the last uh, update is that it will open probably in the end of April, um, and then there will be an investment round, which will probably be a couple of weeks, and um, where people can buy in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this is very exciting. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm always uh, interested in any strategy that gets more aging research funded. And, you know, one of the great things about the field in the last few years is the interest in the private sector. And I think this kind of thing potentially allows a lot more people to get involved in that in that way. So it's cool. We'll have to get an update on how it's going. You know, Absolutely. this is one of the first talks we've had on progeria. And so... Um, the, the question that always arises, you know, the, the individuals look like they age more quickly. Uh, of course, not everything looks like it's aging more quickly. It's, it's, it's segmental usually. How much overlap do you think there is between progeria and aging? Maybe in, in, uh, in this new disease, uh, the Woodhouse Sakati, um, how many, which pathway, can you tell which pathways are accelerated and which ones aren't, or is it, what, what's going on? So Woodhouse Sakati Center is probably um, a DNA metabolism, DNA repair pathway also, and it's probably DNA replication. Um, and so this is, 
this is probably this is I think as far as I will uh, go with the sort of mechanistic uh, in terms of how it overlaps with normal aging. I think it's interesting because it's actually the only progeria where there is progressive uh, cognitive decline. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you look at the other neurological progerias, ataxia lactantia, Cockaine syndrome, some of the serotonin pigmentosum um, subgroups then you see a very strong cerebral degeneration. There is also cerebral effects, but it's a very, very strong um, focus on the cerebellum. So for this progeria, it seems like there's quite significant overlap with normal aging. I think in general, how progeria is associated with normal aging, I think we know that interventions that work in normal aging also, to some extent, work in progeria, suggesting that you are targeting some of the same uh, processes. Um, but of course, aging is, ex- is extremely complex, right? So there's probably reasons for the progeria. You have loss of one pathway, but other um, aging or anti-aging pathways are still present in the cells to maintain e- equilibrium in other tissues. Um, but this is a very, of course, something that we're thinking a lot about. And yeah, I'm wondering if it's possible to go the reverse way. In other words, find things that help progeria, and will that work in normal aging? Yeah. So for the, this is actually, yeah. And, and here, so I can refer to the drug F story. So this is something we've tested in progeria cell lines because we know that there's an increase in DNA damage. So it reduces DNA damage levels in, in, uh, in Hodgkin-Gilford's progeria cells, in ataxia lactantia cells, and in Cockaine syndrome cells, and it extends the lifespan of ataxia lactantia uh, flies. Um, it also reduces. If you look, we also looked in in primary neurons. It can reduce the DNA damage level in primary neurons. Um, so, and and I think for us it's particularly interesting because in in many dementias, you see more DNA damage in, in the brain, in neurons. And we can then, the hope is that maybe we can target a premature aging to begin with, but eventually transition into the more broader mm-hmm. uh, aging phenotypes. I mean, dementias, uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular. So yeah. um, I think this is our strategy. You know, the data, the data registry is amazing in Denmark. And I, I think that, that data you have on looking at different cohorts and survival curves is, is fascinating. Um, looks like there are a lot of drugs, actually, that might um, have impact on increasing at least median life expectancy. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a good look at the curve, but do you, think, do you see things that might affect maximum life expectancy? Yes, yeah, so, so this is... Um... We've looked at that, and here it's a bit depressing because we see a huge amount of drugs that uh, that affects medium lifespan, but all of them appear to end in around the same way. So, um, we got to think about also that all of these drugs are giving because of a of a uh, diagnosis, right? So there's a confounding f- as aspect of the diagnosis. It's also um, rare that drugs are giving throughout the entire lifespan. Um, so there could be effects there. At, um, so this, yeah, so, so we're looking a little bit into the diagnosis aspects. The, the three drugs that we're looking at were selected because, and uh, this is a slide I took out because I had 85 slides. And uh, so, um, we looked at diagnoses also because we know why the drug is giving to a person. And so we have other drugs that are giving to that person or to, that are giving to the same diagnostic code. And then we can stratify which yep. drugs that are given to that diagnostic code leads to the greatest lifespan effect. Uh, and so this is what we did for those three drugs that we've selected for the Vita Dao uh, project. Um, but the maximum lifespan is, is definitely a little bit depressing that we don't see any effect on them on the maximum lifespan. You know, it, it um, 
you're right. As you say, these drugs are given to people because they've been diagnosed with some condition. I guess it's formally possible that the condition itself could be associated with increased survival. You know, if it's a mild condition, and and so, is, do you see that as a possibility as well? That's a very interesting proposal. We haven't looked at that, but that's definitely something that we can look at. So the registries are linked to their healthcare records also, so we know um, what they are. So, I mean, what what kind of ailments they have. Uh, I think also the so the senescence predictor, for example, those two hundred samples mm -hmm. are also linked actually to the drug database. So there's actually part of this patho pathological biobank. There's about three point eight million tissue samples there. So you can actually go in and look at specific oh. tissues. And, and dig that out. And so those 200 samples for the senescence predictor are a part of that biobank. So there's a huge potential in, in getting things out of that. Yeah. Uh, data. You know, I want to go to Max in a second. I just wanted to say, ask one more question. You were talking about one of the compounds uh, and you say the term sinoreversal. Uh, so that was under, a, I guess, a gamma radiation induced senescence paradigm, if I understood so uh, how do you know it's sinoreversal and not just preventing senescence? So because we wait until the cells are senescent. So we ionizing, we induce ionizing radiation, then we wait seven days, the cells stop growing. There is no proliferation. There's no expression of PCNA. Then we add the drug and then the cells start expressing PCNA again and go into cell cycle. And it's not a, I mean, it's, a, it's a sort of almost all cells that will start expressing PCNA. So it's not a, I don't think we are sort of selecting a population of cells. And then if you look at cell numbers, then they go up for a little bit, but then they plateau again. We also try to look in replicative senescence. So we treated yeah, cells. My next question. <laughs> yeah. And we did treat cells with the, with the drug for, for six months. I think that was quite painful experiment and this is one of the first experiments we did and we saw that this particular compound drug f uh, extends the replicative senescent uh, senescence of uh, of the cells but you don't you don't know if you if you get the cell senescence replicatively and then add the drug you don't know if it reverses right that's true. I don't, we haven't done that experiment. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, it's always been thought that that's a ir irreversible phenomenon. I know that's come under question. Yeah. That would be an interesting thing to do. Anyway, yeah. let me turn it over to Max. I'm sure we have a bunch of questions and uh, Max, what's up? So we've got a few questions coming in. Um, and one is from Tarun who wants to know what you were talking about, Martin, can this be translated into what we should be doing? What our consumption and behavior patterns should be in our daily lives? So the, the registry data for sure can tell us something. I think, um, you know, the metformin data, although you have sort of this, you have this lifespan extension initially and then it crosses over, I think that's because of the underlying diabetes, but I take metformin myself because I think it's quite promising. Um, there's also the data, the registry is linked to uh, socioeconomic aspects also in connection to where do you live in, in terms of what's your pollution level around you and, and these things. And we have not looked into that, but this is something that we can get from that data for sure. Um, I mean, I think the take home message is that, that you can probably affect aging in many ways. And um, hopefully we can get a little bit closer to that from some of this data. So follow-up questions like, uh, is there like anything that we can do to accelerate the DNA repair? I mean, that's... Besides, besides take drug F. <laughs> yeah, besides take drug F. I mean, there's some work showing that NAD uh, is also regulated of DNA repair and boosting NAD levels may impact um, DNA repair. This is, so you can take a, an NAD booster like nicotinamide riboside or nicotinamide mononucleotide this may increase your ability to uh, to repair your DNA. That being said, you know those types of lesions that we're seeing are lesions that are that. So the 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 
those three lesions that occur after ionizing radiation induced senescence or receivable repetitive senescence are lesions that the machinery does not seem to be able to cope with. So they stick around. So even though the biochemical enzymes are there, they're able to repair all the other damage that dynamic sticks around, suggesting that it's, it's composed of something else than just normal uh, DNA damage. And so for some reason, and we don't know why that is yet, but we're getting closer. Are those, sites yet, random, are those sites randomly dispersed in the chromosomes? Does anybody look? Uh, someone has, people have looked at that, and there are some uh, idea that it could be associated with telomeres, but um, I don't think that is completely well um, accepted uh, broadly. So, but this is definitely also a possibility, right? Maybe we're just stimulating telomerase, and this uh, allows the cells to go back in culture. The, the thing is that it's a bit surprising that you see it with with the ionizing radiation induced damage. So, um, so it's probably something else, I think. Yeah, but we look, we're trying to identify the target of drug F. This is a big endeavor in the lab now. Yeah. We've got another question uh, from David and he wants to know what are actually some of the major causes of DNA damage over one's lifetime that may contribute to the aging process? Yes, this is a great uh, question. Um, I mean, there are many different types of DNA damage, and there are many biochemical pathways that are specialized to deal with that particular type of damage. So um, ionizing radiation, maybe from background radiation around you, will induce, or could uh, induce uh, breaks in your DNA. If you go out into the sunlight, you induce um, UV damage to your DNA. This is repaired by something called nucleoside excision repair. Um, oxidative stress typically leads to single um, base modifications, like 8-oxyguanine, which is repaired through a pathway called base excision repair. Um, and um, there are many other types of damage. So, for example, um, if you if you have um, um, like if you fry food and it gets very dark, you can get these polar aromatic hydrocarbons, which these can can form DNA adducts, and and, and um, these are typically repaired also by nucleoside system repair. Um, so there's a lot of different DNA damage out there, and every day in each cell of our body, we actually generate more than a hundred thousand lesions to the DNA, and the vast majority of those are repaired. Um, so the repair machinery is extremely efficient, actually. And there's a lot of redundancies behind it. So considering that you get 100,000 lesions every day, and then three of those, when they stick around and are not repaired, that can induce, in essence, I think, tells us something about the, the biochemistry in these lesions may be different. So another question, which goes a little bit in this direction, but um, how does damage genome actually contribute to aging? Do we like really understand it in detail? Uh, no, we actually don't really understand that in great detail. So the, we understand, uh, we have a, quite a um, good idea of, of the biochemistry of each type of lesion. Uh, and we know there are many diseases associated with mutations in these enzymes that repair these lesions, but their individual uh, association um, and how they lead to pathology is really not well understood. And there are protein complexes that act together, the mRN complex, for example, where if you get a mutation in one component of it, you get a vastly different phenotype than if you get a mutation in another component of it. So that tells us something about that we really don't understand the, the progression from, from the lesion and down to the pathology. It's like the underlying complexity of the entire process. Um, we don't and we have a question from Tyler who wants to know, is there actually like a common denominator between like all those age accelerated syndromes? A common denominator? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the historical common, common denominator is, uh, is DNA damage or genome instability. But um, if you look at when we did this fishing expedition, looking for premature aging diseases from OMIM, we get a huge amount of diseases that are um, 
that are probably not DNA repair disorders. And I think the, the reason why these progerias are associated with DNA repair disorders is because these are diseases where you see uh, visible aging, so it's typically skin aging. And skin is exposed to a lot of DNA damaging lesions. Uh, and its DNA metabolism is probably very important for maintaining your skin. Um, but some of the other diseases, so uh, mitochondrial diseases, for example, there's also an overlap with normal aging. These ones do not show premature aging in the skin and are therefore not, a, a clinician would not say this person looks old because the person does not look old, but it, it may have accelerated aging of other organs, for example, the brain, cerebellum and other organs. So this is, I mean, at a lower threshold level, you know, it could be that a, a, a huge percentage of diseases are, are associated with aging, right? I mean, we think of aging driving disease, but a lot of diseases are probably accelerating aging as well. And so I, you know, I, I we, we used to think that was a rare phenomenon that only these rare diseases, but now I think it's probably a very common thing, right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's really good. Well, um, I've got like one more, which is like, um, let's assume we um, fix the problem of uh, DNA damage. We solve it, right? Um, how much health and lifespan extension would you expect from that? I mean, this is a good question. You know, this is quite speculation. Um, I have no idea. I, I would hope uh, more than 20%. But <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I uh, think it probably contributes quite a lot, but I, I don't know how much. I, I think the most important thing, Martin, is that you have about a year or two to solve the DNA damage problem. And you can find out. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Sounds great. I'll try my best. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for doing the show tonight. I hope we can... Uh, connect again I, I i'll say yes to the meeting i promise i think i have already but i'm not sure but I, I, you have you have already brian so oh, okay. <laughs> i just wanted to remind you <laughs> <laughs> all right great so i'll be seeing you then i hope uh, sounds great sounds uh, and uh, thanks again for doing the show uh, i want to remind everyone to use the panelists and all attendees button to make comments in the chat box after the talk um, our next speaker is uh, really exciting for us. It's Andrea Meyer, uh, who is currently uh, at the University of Melbourne, but as of the next month, she will be the clinical director for the Center for Healthy Longevity here at National University of Singapore. So we're really excited to having her come on board. Um, you're probably getting tired of me, so I may even ask her to host a few shows in the future. Uh, so uh, her talk next week is going to be bringing geroscience to clinical practice. So how do we humanize all these stuff we've done in animal models? Um, and so uh, please tune in next week to watch that. It's going to be an exciting show. Of course, Morton's was exciting too. Don't, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to leave you tonight with a video about what happens when an old people's home is visited by four-year-olds. Thanks for joining the show and I'll see you uh, next week. Fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Better than sitting around doing nothing. <laughs>
Keep going. <laughs> so you've nearly doubled the amount of steps you're taking per day. Go, go, squeeze, 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 squeeze. Your strength has increased by 15 kilograms. Good heavens. All your old personal trainers, that's a good word. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> now we've got these results, we need to act on them. I grew in party, thank you, buddy. This experiment has acted as a template for how this model of care can be rolled out elsewhere in Australia. We need to keep the momentum going so we can deliver a better future for our older Australians. This is what I need every day. So it's up and onwards from here. <laughs>